Are you looking to expand your aesthetic practice and attract high quality new patients? Discover the power of digital marketing in growing your practice with a personalized strategy session. Join Ryan Davies, Equas Marketing Director, for an exclusive 90-minute meeting. Ryan and his team will invest hours prior to your session, crafting a customized marketing plan tailored specifically for your practice. This invaluable opportunity comes at no cost to you, with no commitments attached. Schedule your meeting with Ryan today and take the first step towards transforming your practice with the potential of digital marketing. You are listening to another episode of the Business of Aesthetic podcast series, brought to you by our gold sponsors, MRP and Equa Marketing. We also want to thank our silver sponsors, Pronox and Lengea Law. If you would like to network and share your experience with our podcast guests and other aesthetic industry professionals, join our Facebook or LinkedIn communities by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce our passionate host, Dana Zeitler. With over three decades of expertise in the dynamic world of aesthetics as the founder and CEO of Deluxe Medspa, Dana brings unparalleled insight and experience to our podcast. Over to you, Dana. Welcome to another captivating installment of the Business of Aesthetics podcast. My name is Dana Zeitler. I'm a physician assistant and med spa owner in Naples, Florida. Before we immerse ourselves into the riches of learning all about um, artificial intelligence in aesthetics, I want to take a moment to to express our gratitude to our incredible listeners. Your willingness to embrace and share this podcast allows our community to grow and serve others. Your unwavering dedication is the cornerstone of our success, and we can't thank you enough. So today, I am thrilled and honored to have Dr. Akash Shonda Walker. I'm going to try to get that. I might just call you Dr. Akash if that's okay. I have, I have wanted to pick your brain about AI ever since hearing you speak at the Subio Needle Art in September. But before we dive in, I want to give the listeners a little bit about your very prestigious background. You are undergraduate at MIT, uh, med school at Harvard, surgical residency at Johns Hopkins, fellowship at Stanford, another fellowship at Lenox Hill in New York City, and now you're in Tampa at the Lawfer Institute. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So tell the listeners a little bit about you. I know that you are published in textbooks. You're quoted in the Wall Street Journal. You sit on editorial boards of aesthetic surgery journals, and you're part of Aesthetic Society on international committees. So tell the listeners a little bit more about how you got into AI and what's, um, you know, what's happening with that in the world. Sure. Yeah. And I really appreciate you guys for having me here. Um, It's really great to have engaged listeners in the aesthetic community who are excited about expanding their roles, about pushing the forefront of science and questioning uh, what we do every day. Um, You know, it's more than just a needle for the injector. It's more than just a scalpel for the surgeon. So um, I'm excited to find this community of people who are really excited about uh, the same things that I'm excited about. Um, So that's that's first um, and foremost. about me, I kind of got involved in the AI field um, a little accidentally, but I've always been very focused about technology and the cutting edge things going on. Um, I get very bored by uh, just doing the same thing over and over again uh, without seeing improvements or seeing how you can do things better, cheaper, better for the patients. Um, you know, and those are exciting questions. And I think uh, in aesthetics, we've uh, we have the tools to kind of harness uh, technology within our field to push things forward. But unfortunately, we're also in a field where there's a lot of snake oil out there. So it's really hard for the consumer. It's hard for even the practitioner to find out what's real, what's good. So, uh, you know, that's kind of where I come from. Um, I'm always questioning things, um, questioning the status quo, why we do things. And when I don't get good answers about why we are doing things, how we're doing something that has stemmed stemmed from my training and probably gotten me in trouble a time or two. Um, You know, that's when I start to really do deep dives into things. Um, I, you know, 
uh, was a science kid my whole life, um, did science and engineering, uh, high school magnet program, was taking the train up to Newark, New Jersey to do a research lab stuff over the summer, uh, was working in tissue engineering, whatever the latest and coolest thing that was going on in science I wanted to be a part of. Um, and uh, my med school was kind of an interesting hybrid uh, w between MIT and Harvard, where we actually had 30 students who were really focused on uh, learning medicine, but from a technology engineering and basic science standpoint. So when we were learning about anatomy, we were doing free body diagrams and physics diagrams about how the muscles were pulling on things. And, you know, at the time I said, this is a little annoying. I'm not sure how this is going to relate. But then when we start questioning the fundamentals about what we're doing, even from uh, injections of uh, different muscles in the face and how they uh, can something raise an eyebrow, can something fill and lift a jowl, um, you go back to these core physics pr principles because physics is physics. It's not going to change and gravity works the same way everywhere around the world. Um, so that really gave me the foundation for really learning about how to apply technology into medicine. Now, when I was in residency, I had a lot of ideas and I did not know how to bring them to light and bring them to the consumer. I was busy doing my residency and there was no way for me to really learn how to do that myself. So I took a year off, went out to Silicon Valley. Um, I did a fellowship in uh, really medical device, innovation, design thinking at Stanford Biodesign. And then in the evenings, I would work with the Life Science Angel Investment Group where I would be looking at new technologies that were coming in and learning how to assess those technologies for success. And while I was there, I saw really what was going on in the AI field. And I thought, okay, that's going on in a different sector. People are using it for you know, Uber, for optimizing uh, their routes and deliveries, optimizing those routes. And they were really more in the technology sector. But I started to look over the fence from our aesthetic you know, little hole that we live in. And I saw that people were using it in other parts of medicine. And not only were they you know, helping the clinicians and the providers, they were actually outperforming them. And these were in fields like ophthalmology, radiology, dermatology. They were deploying AI tools and it was being used really well. Um, and that's when I started to see how is there, how can we do this in aesthetics? Because no one was doing this in aesthetics. No one was doing this in plastic surgery. So that's when the light bulb kind of comes up, you know, came about for me, and I think the light bulb should go off for anybody. When you start seeing things in other fields and you try to figure out how to apply it to your field, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You see how somebody else's wheels are working on their car and you can get it on your car. So, you know, that's where I kind of started to delve into the world of AI and, and aesthetics and plastic surgery. And we wrote one of the first papers kind of just looking at the, practi the practical application of AI and plastic surgery. And eventually that led me down the path of doing a lot of research in the AI field. Well, I think it's fascinating. And I think it's just kind of like if you think back to when we all got computers in, in our household, like I think 2023 is going to be the year that people look back. And yes, pe other people were using it in the past, but now it's almost like the common folk, like all of us. And if we're not using it, we're going to be left in the dust because it can do things faster, more efficiently. And I think you talked in your, your talk at Subio about how, you know, it's, if you plug a question into AI, you can get LSAT answers and MI, um, MCAT answers that are in the 85th percentile or something. So it was really fascinating. So tell me about, you know, how um, how AI can you be used to improve? Let's start with patient safety and outcomes. Let's start there. And just, you sure. know, how do you think that, that AI can be used for patient safety? And then I really want to get into business aspects because it's business of aesthetics, but I want to touch on this a little bit because I think it's so important. Yeah, and, and I think one thing that you mentioned is kind of 2023 being a year of AI. Uh, there's a reason why that has come about. And it's really, you know, chat GPT and open AI becoming at the forefront of having the everyday user be able to use AI tools. When I would give talks in the past about AI, um, it was really a research project. The 
regular surgeon or the regular you know uh, injector couldn't deploy these tools without having a coder and someone to implement things and uh, you know there were largely research projects at that point where you needed access to somebody who could translate that stuff from the practical realm to the you know through the science and data science into something that you could use with ChatGPT that's kind of changed the game it became something that everyone can use on your browser and on your phone and use pretty easily um, to, to really get answers that you want or to do some analyses that you want. So, you know, that democratization of AI, I, I think is more the theme of 2023 because this has been going on for a while, but the everyday user didn't have access to it. So this is what's really pushed this forward in our, in our field. Um, you know, I think related to patient safety and outcomes, I think really AI um, holds the power of taking some subjectivity out of uh, out of what we do in aesthetics. Aesthetics is an incredibly subjective field that makes it really hard. Going back to the snake oil, mm -hmm. what's real, what's not? You go to a conference and somebody's talking about a new technique or my specific technique, or I have a course where I can do something better than somebody else, and they flash a few cherry picked before and afters. And they say, look, the person looks better. And you kind of look at it and you say, okay, I guess so. But you don't have a really good tool to, one, analyze what are new technologies or techniques, if they're actually effective in the subjective aesthetic space, or even to self-analyze what you're doing if it's working properly or if you're maximizing what you're doing. And here, here's an example that we've done in our research um, area. Um, we've taken facial rejuvenation uh, before and afters, and we asked AI tools um, to serve as an objective third party that can assess things like how old someone looks or how attractive they look, how feminine or masculine they look. And that's based on previous data sets of millions and millions of facial analyses that have been done. I mean, the analysis of face and AI is is has long been done for a lot of different tools in other areas. Um, and so after a treatment, you can have AI assess, reassess those metrics such as age and see how those may have changed based on a treatment, a technique your, or what you did or something you've changed in what you've done. And that gives you an objective assessment of an intervention and then a result. And so that allows for better evaluation of your own techniques, new techniques, devices, uh, et cetera, which all lead to better patient safety and outcomes because we're no longer deciding, hmm, does this thing work? I guess the person looks better, I guess, um, to something that has more numbers behind it. Well, it's so interesting. And you you also talked a little bit at the at the conference about how patient, this is going to be in patients' hands at some point where like companies like Cetaphil and La Roche-Posay, they are, you know, marketing to patients to say, okay, use our product and this is a the result that you might get. So in, you know, in plastic surgery, in aesthetics, for us as well to be able to market to our patients with a tool that um, I think you said could standardize how people send the photo back to you, you know, making the face be in specific positions so that it's standardized um, will help, you know, market to patients. But the other really th interesting thing, and it's kind of like a two-part um, either statement or question is what you said about snake oil. So there's all of these before and afters out there, and many of them are face tuned or photoshopped. And this tool that you were talking about uh, or potential tool could kind of screen for um, inauthentic, inauthentic pictures that aren't the exact same angle that manipulate the marketing to make the photos look better than they actually are. And, you know, that comes back to patient safety as well, because if patients think that they're going to be able to get an outcome that is that nobody could get, even, you know, for, for, for me, for as an injector, there are surge, you know, results out there that plastic surgeons can't get. Um, and these tools in AI, they might help the consumer um, more safely consume that material on social media or even in journals. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I think there's a huge uh, opportunity here to standardize things for the patient. And, and I think that's really important because it's hard, really hard for the patient to determine what's good and what's not. Um, we've all seen the before and afters on social media, on websites where, you know, someone's touting some neck treatment and the before picture, the lady's laying in bed and, you know, she's got her neck back and it's in a weirdly lit room, dark lighting, et cetera. And then the after picture, they're standing up and their necks out and there's, you know, a, a uh, ring light on them that's getting rid of all the wrinkles and creases and the patient has makeup on. Uh, there's so many variables that make it hard to assess these things from a patient uh, who's looking at different marketing tools. In fact, I tell my patients like anything that they find online that they think is, you know, oh, oh I want this result. It, it may not be the result of anything, you know, any treatment at all. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes patient um, uploaded photographs itself, even though they're not standardized, or at least, you know, aren't altered. Now right. we said, how can we use AI to combat this? Well, one for the very, you know, grossly negligent um, uh, people or people who are actually maliciously um, altering pictures or doing Photoshop or Facetune or things like that to their before and afters, which is, you know, uh, just incredibly um, bad for patients and and disingenuous to our entire field. Uh, you know, we can use AI tools to detect those things that humans have a difficult time detecting. Um, we, we've been able to uh, deploy some tools that can detect Photoshop and Facetune using AI by training AI algorithms what Photoshop looks like and what a surgical result, actual surgical result looks like. And it does a pretty good job um, of detecting where and if a, a photo has been altered. And when we compared it to if humans could detect it after we purposefully photoshopped some pictures and tried to trick the tools, the AI tool was almost 100% accurate and humans were much, much less accurate, somewhere on the 60% range. So, you know, there is something where potentially this could be applied to all conferences or mm -hmm. in all journals or, you know, maybe even the big social media platforms will take this on as something to combat that really malicious um, attempt to alter before and after. Well, even now, as, I, I agree, even as a provider that sometimes even, even some of the, the companies that sell laser devices, let's say, or skin tightening devices, um, you know, I'll look at before and afters on social media and I, I can't even tell as a provider, um, you know, it looks better to me, but then if I look really closely, well, maybe the patient's smiling ever so slightly in that after picture, or I know that there's a trick where people like hold their tongue up at the top of their uh, throat to make their, their um, little area underneath the, the gobbler look a little smaller. So even as an educated provider who's been doing this for 15 years, I can sometimes get um, tricked. So I think having this tool, to, you know, to really be like, hey, these results are believable. These results are authentic, will help me as a provider, and therefore I can help my patients, which is really important. And I think, you know, to that end, you know, the second part of that is creating consistent standardized uh, photos you know, lighting, angles, all those things is really hard to do. All of us know we try, even those that we try to do the exact same thing, it drives us nuts if there's a slight angle deviation in one of the before pictures and you can never take the before picture again. So now you're stuck with that picture. This is really hard for, uh, I think, people to do and uh, conceptualize on their own because there's so many um, degrees of movement and, and, the variables of lighting and all that stuff are really tough for a single person to control, let alone if you're in a bigger practice and there's other people uh, involved that are using the same spaces. It's hard to control that stuff. Or if you're traveling between spaces or if you have travel patients and you need to, you want to get follow up on those patients, but they're not in your controlled environment. These are all areas where we can use AI tools to uh, help standardize some of those variables that are difficult for us to do so. Um, I'm sure any of you that have done, you know, depositing a check, right, on your phone, 
those tools exist so that you can, you know, see the edges of the check exactly where it needs to be for the bank to be able to have a standardized way of looking at all the checks. Similarly, um, we're working on tools to be able to create platforms that patients can use to take standardized photos themselves or providers can use to kind of lock in when it's in the right place as a, as a before picture or have the same ones every time. Um, you know, these are difficult problems actually, but uh, we do have the technology in our phones. I mean, our phones can tell our faces as our face from almost any angle right now. Um, and whether we're wearing, you know, somebody's wearing makeup, someone's wearing glasses, someone's wearing headphones, your phone's able to kind of has the power to do this um, type of analysis right in the palm of our hand. So we should um, be looking forward to using some of these uh, potentially even three-dimensional tools uh, to create some of these um, standardized uh, photos in the future of our results. And that kind of goes into also helping us get more data sets that are standardized for future AI tools. Uh, a common term in AI is garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. uh, if And it's really hard for us as researchers and AI developers to get aesthetic data that is clean uh, when we're taking them from all different parts of, uh, you know, all different types of practices, um, individuals, big university settings, they're being taken in all different ways and different lighting and with different standards, even if they're standardized within each practice. That makes it really hard to leverage these tools accurately across larger populations. So some of these tools that allow us to take more standardized before and afters, um, maybe even uh, functional before and afters and using movement and things like that will really help us build tools that are more accurate, more powerful for simulations and things like that going forward. Yeah, that, that's that's going to be a big, a big market is really trying to figure out standardization. I know I struggle with it in my practice as well. I have a DSLR and, you know, we, but we have different people taking pictures and it just depends, you know, how careful my medical assistant was when she's taking the pictures as to that angle being exactly the same. So I struggle with that as well. But I wanted to touch on one other thing that I thought was really interesting that you talked about at the conference, which was the consultation and using AI in the consultation to show, I think you were talking about a breast patient and showing a breast patient whether she needed a lift or just an implant. And you were able to use AI to show her if she only did the implant, what the result would be versus if she did the implant and the lift. So I think from a business aspect, being able to plug AI tools into our I guess you called it like a simulation of what the patient's results would be and how that could affect the, you know, the consultation process and, you know, explaining to the patient realistically, hey, this is what our results could be versus this so that they they know ahead of time. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, to me, one of the most exciting parts of what we've been doing in the research space that I'm hoping come to fruition. Um, I'm sure... A lot of you have used simulation software um, in this industry, and it's not great. Um, it is based, it's not really based on previous actual results. It's based on some computer modeling, which doesn't really mimic how tissues react. Um, as we all know, like adding filler in one place, you know, one cc of filler doesn't give you like one cc of of fill in that area because some goes into the tissues and it depends on the tissue type, et cetera. These are all things that are hard to explain to a patient, right? But AI basically can leverage prior experiences to predict outcomes for different treatments given a new situation, like a new patient or a new treatment. And this can be super helpful for personalized treatment plans with simulations or even without simulations, just as patient decision tools. So the example you gave is this research project that we did using AI to help personalize treatment plans for breast surgery patients. Um, like you said, a difficult decision or discussion that we have uh, for breast surgery is whether or not a patient will require a breast slip uh, in addition to an augmentation or not, uh, depending on the amount of sagging that the breast has. And this is a particularly difficult decision because 
it inc- involves an extra scar and things like that. So the patient has to kind of weigh these pros and cons. Uh, the cons are easy. You can draw a scar and show what the scar looks like potentially. But the pros are difficult to tell them what the difference would be on a patient that you can't really, you can kind of move the tissues on their body, but they can't really see it or understand one versus the other as easily. Well, so we created a tool that can help patients make a decision based on AI simulations of each option and which one may match what they want. So we train the algorithm on um, before and afters uh, of augmentations and then augmentation breast lifts that uh, one experienced surgeon had. So all of her career is worth of uh, before and afters. So that gave us a relatively strong data set to go off of. And given the new patient, the algorithm that we trained can show what an augmentation only or an augmentation breast lift, lift would look like for that patient. And this isn't just moving pixels around to make it uh, on that patient. It generates a completely new photo, you know, photorealistic one of a patient that doesn't actually exist, right? Um, and based on the outcome, the algorithm can help the patient decide which one fits the amount of drooping or volume loss that that patient has based on this large compendium of experience, this patient, this uh, surgeon's entire career of experience uh, that the algorithm has now incorporated into its knowledge base. So you can imagine how powerful that tool is because you know, you're know you sitting in front of a patient saying, you know, I think you need a lift and it would involve a scar and the patient's saying, ah, I really don't want to do the scar. I think I just want to do an augmentation and you can show them like, well, with an augmentation, you're going to have this subpar result uh, based on you. And this is a computer telling you, not me. Again, this is helping the patient take the snake oil out of it. You know, their consumers are wary, right? They, they're saying, are you telling me this option because it's what I actually need? Or are you telling me this option because it is generating more revenue for you or something, right? Um, I'm sure in the injector world, the amount of filler that a patient may need is a really difficult discussion because filler is, you know, priced on volume, but some patients need more volume and doing a lesser amount of volume, you know, may give them a subpar result or even a result worse than doing nothing at all. Hmm. Um, You know, so you can imagine this kind of thing for facial treatments or the decision between filler lasers or surgery, um, what things could look like in each of those realms. So this is really giving power to the patient that, hey, here's some objective third party that's saying this is kind of what things would look like in each of these based on, you know, all of Dana's uh, prior results. And this is how in Dana's hands, things would look like doing all these different options. Or this is what surgery versus filler would look like if someone's kind of going back and forth between those decisions. Um, These decision tools powered by AI are going to be immensely important for patients. And the AI part of it is really just the pattern recognition, uh, but it's on a huge computing scale that, you know, it takes an entire career to build for a human. Here we can do it in minutes. Yeah. And it's also, uh, you know, important to be able to, as you said, objectively show the after picture, because if the patient comes back and they say, oh, you know, I don't really notice a difference. And if it's so subtle in those after pictures, which sometimes it can be, especially with injectables, the AI can, you talked about it um, showing more masculine, more feminine, kind of softer, um, you know, that's important to be able to, to share with your patients objectively. It's not just me saying you look better, but the computer is also objectively saying, can you talk a little bit about the that masculine feminine um, score that your program has? Is it your program or a different program? It, these are these are off the shelf uh, programs that exist, um, you know, all over the place. Um, the ones I have used were with Microsoft and you know the a lot of companies have created these facial analyses tools and they're powerful in that regard that they are telling you something that the before picture looks this you know it's the goal of that is really to they're doing facial recognition so the facial recognition part is okay is this a male or a female and that's what the goal of that tool is created and so you get a percentage of, okay, we think it's 63% male or 75% male or 23% female. 
that's that's great for the computer to kind of trying to make do its math. But if you actually take that out from the computer, we can use it in our realm and say, we're not trying to determine if somebody's male or female. We're trying to see if that uh, percentage changes based on our treatment. If we're trying to feminize someone, we're hoping that the computer has a high, uh, detects the after picture as a higher probability of being female. That suggests that You've taken some of the guesswork out that this patient is female for the computer. That's a really objective way to say that you've added uh, feminization to a patient. Um, similarly, masculine, you know, if you want to make a masculine jawline for a patient, well, if the after picture is 99% sure that's a man versus the before picture, it was like 70%, you've effectively masculinized that patient. You can say, yeah, we did it. We achieved it. Um, this was your goal. So I think that's a kind of important um, important tool that can be used and they're they're off the shelf. You can use them. Um, people have created APIs to uh, be able to do this type of thing. That's super interesting. So let's switch gears to AI for social media. I mean, I know we talked about kind of the snake oil on social media, but let's talk about AI making our social media lives easy, which I have, I haven't quite started doing this, but I really, really want to. I'm like, oh, I want to make an easy caption. So talk a little bit about how aesthetic owners can A, save time, effort, energy by, you know, making posts and things like that with, uh, with AI. Yeah, I think this is incredibly important because social media is becoming a almost necessary evil for even those of us that don't enjoy uh, creating content like that. Um, we kind of have to because that's where our consumer lives. The difficult part is that's really time consuming from the things that we like to do, which is inject and operate and and treat patients. Uh, so if you don't have a dedicated social media team, how do you do this by yourself? It's really hard um, and takes a lot of time. I think before I started using AI, I was spending like three hours a day trying to edit clips, um, trying to make it match music, figure out a caption that makes sense and is captivating. Um, but that's really hard to do for someone who's one, not trained to do that and is not a marketing person. Uh, and two, doesn't have three hours a day to do that. Uh, so, you know, one, I think the probably most useful tool for somebody is using chat GPT. Um, this allows you to, you can basically ask it to do something. You, it acts as a personal assistant that has access to the entire world of, uh, information. So, you know, you want an idea for an Instagram post or a story, you can ask it, Hey, I'm trying to get. Uh, more patients who want to get lip filler. Can you give me 10 ideas on interesting posts? And it will generate some ideas for you, things you wouldn't have thought of. And then you can say, well, those are a little cheesy. And you can tell it, these are cheesy. Make them more serious. I'm a more serious uh, injector. And I want my content to be more serious. And it will alter those like that. So you almost talk to it like you'd be talking to somebody else and it can create those for you. It can create captions for you. And then you can read the caption. You say, that's not really me. You can say, here's a caption I've written. Can you write this new caption in my voice? Uh, it's just so powerful because it allows you to do some, either somebody you'd have to pay a lot of money to do um, and maybe not do as good a, a job uh, to allow you to do it in a few seconds from your desktop and then you can upload it to the uh, post, a lot of the uh, a lot of the software to create the photos or videos, they have some AI components built into it because they've started to uh, work with ChatGPT and OpenAI to interface with it, so that you could use the power of that within their apps. And so, if you're creating a video, it's kind of all in one place, and it allows you to cut the video as you know, easily as you want and generally comes out with a pretty good result. Yeah, I think you were talking about Canva and how Canva is integrated now with uh, AI to to help people create 10 or 15 posts. But also, like you said, 
garbage in, garbage out. So it's really important how you ask the AI for that information if you want sort of more specific content. And I think that's kind of what I struggle with a little bit is I'm like, okay, how do I ask this question that it's going to be a very specific answer that it gives me a nice starting place to, to then tweak and make it a little bit more my own. So, um, yeah. And I think there's, there is kind of a default uh, that chat GPT outputs uh, in terms of voice. So I can kind of tell when someone's put a, a caption that's definitely written by ChatGPT, and it just seems, you know, there ChatGPT itself almost has a tone to it. Um, but what you can do is you can feed it things that are your voice, and you can kind of teach it and train it to be like you. Uh, so that gives it an idea of how you write or how you talk, and then it can kind of help you create that content. Um, I definitely suggest that people don't just like input information to ChatGPT and output it to their websites to you, you need to review it you need to make sure it's in your voice um, these are things I think that give you an idea and starting off point uh, but that's sometimes the things that really hold up and take time is trying to figure out like where to start I think mm -hmm. editing things in your voice is a lot easier um, and you can ask ChatGPT to help to help it but you have to give it some information too to be able to output what you want so there is a little bit of art uh, and science to talking to chat GPT. Yeah, there's there's so much to learn. And I feel like there needs to be courses on this in addition to the, I mean, I know you did a talk on it, but I feel like it could be a whole course on how to utilize it properly because we didn't touch on how you use AI in your practice to make you more efficient. But I think you did talk about it at the conference about using a script for your um for your notes in the room. Can you just um, briefly talk about that? Cause I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the bane of every person's health in healthcare is documentation, which is just so painful. Like, you know, even some people are like, Oh, I have to see another patient because, and it's not that they don't want to see a patient. So they have a ton of paperwork on the back end of every single patient. Um, and that's like driven people out of medicine. Uh, well, you know, People then have gotten in-person scribes to come and help them with that documentation to take that, you know, part that they don't like to do um, and focus on really the patient care, which should be the case. But having an in-person scribe is like an incredible luxury. Uh, it's like having a personal assistant um, that most people don't have and are pretty costly. Well, here comes along AI now that, you know, essentially here's your personal assistant that can work for much cheaper because it's deployable everywhere. And, uh, you know, I've started to use AI in my practice as a virtual scribe where it can just listen to an entire uh, conversation. Even, you know, the pleasantries at the beginning of, a, you know, how was your vacation? Oh, tell me about that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or I, I saw pictures of your kid. They look like they're growing up. You know, things that are not germane to the medical part of the exam. And it knows that. It, it knows based on listening to millions of previous encounters, it knows what's medical and needs to go in a medical note and what's not. And so it can generate some of this information very quickly for you so that your note can take five minutes instead of taking you 20 minutes to give a nice detailed note about what you've done on the patient, what you've talked about and what the plans are. Um, so that is something that has um, rapidly helped me in my efficiencies, you know, be able to finish my documentation and get home sooner instead of uh, sitting there trying to make sure I'm typing out everything that happened with every single patient. Uh, that's just painstaking. Yeah. So, so interesting. And, and I, I need to, I need that. I'm going to have to make a note on the the podcast notes with whichever one you use, because I think that probably could help a lot of listeners be more efficient, which we're always, you know, we're just trying to get more yeah. efficient in our practice. So um, that's another thing where if the more you feed it, the better it comes out like you. So, you know, these tools don't just spit out the general note for you. You can say, here's what my note for filler looks like. This is what my note for tear trough filler looks like. And AI can learn kind of based on your interactions and what your 
template kind of looks like, it will create that for you. So that's really the exciting part about this. It's not just, you know, 10 years ago, dictation and uh, virtual dictation was more about just writing exactly what was said in the room, which is almost useless because you still have to spend a ton of time taking out stuff that doesn't apply mm -hmm. and putting it in the format that you want. This allows you, you know, the AI tools to learn your voice, learn what you want in a note, learn what you need in a note for your specific situation and apply, you know, the fundamentals to it. So do you have really to, cool. do you have to ask the patient permission before you press record on that? Or is it just like part of your practice? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's state by state, you know, it's essentially recording, um, a, I think recording without consent in general, right, whether it's in the medical setting or not, I would always suggest that in any of these situations where you're doing something that's different than the norm, that you have a consent form that tells a patient why you're doing something and they can opt out if they want. Um, generally telling a patient, hey, I'm using this tool that's not storing any of your information uh, to just help me focus on you and not on documenting things. Uh, most patients are like, oh, that's great. Yeah, let's focus on me. Um, rather than, you know, everyone's seeing the person who's sitting at the computer while the patient's talking to them and they're back to the patient and they're asking questions. That's not how medicine is meant to be. That's not how aesthetics certainly is meant to be. Um, we're forming relationships with our patients and that's a face-to-face -face thing. It's not a face-to-computer to face. Yeah, no, you're right. You can make eye contact because you don't have to worry about documenting everything that they say because you can look at it later for sure. I think it will make that connection. And in aesthetics, it's a huge part of the consultation is making the connection with your patient. So um, very valuable. And that's a tool I definitely want to try out um, using. So as we wrap up, because we're getting um, towards the end of the time, um, I think we could talk for another hour about all of these AI, because there's so much to learn. There's so much to explore. Maybe they'll let us do it again. You never know. Yeah. Sense of aesthetics. Um, I want to uh, for you to share um, where the listeners can find and learn more about you. And if you have any upcoming meetings or publications where people can find you. Sure. Um, well, you know, I, we're doing a lot of research in this area and we publish a lot of it in Aesthetic Surgery Journal. Uh, they, they have really been uh, at the forefront of um, accepting AI and figuring out even good um, uses and uh, ethical uses for AI within research and publishing. Um, so that's where you'll see a lot of our work. You'll see them at the meetings as well. And um, I'll be giving talks at a variety of conferences like the Octane Aesthetic Tech Forum uh, coming up in January um, about kind of how to integrate AI into your practices. Um, I am uh, personally based in Tampa, Florida. Um, if, uh, you know, I'm working with a lot of med spas. We're, we're doing a lot of learning uh, around the injector surgeon relationship. Um, and that's what I really enjoy. Um, Still doing plastic surgery head to toe in the middle of all of this, um, which I really enjoy. Um, if you want more information about me and what we're doing, uh, my Instagram uh, is uh, drdoctor.akashplasticsurgery, or you can visit my website, um, drakashplasticsurgery.com. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, I will have I'll post those notes to the the bio for the podcast so that maybe you know they'll just be able to link on that to find you but i again am so grateful that you took the time out of your very very busy schedule to share with our listeners your knowledge on ai and we all have a lot to learn and i think we just need to take advantage of so you're a huge resource for the future of um ai and aesthetics so thank you again for being here. And I also want to thank our listeners for uh, taking a moment for that. We appreciate each and one of you. We cannot do what we do without you. If you like our podcast, kindly share it with your friends and on social media. Also, please don't forget to write a review on iTunes or Google Play. Your reviews will help other doctors and practice owners find us. Until we meet again, wishing you all an amazing week ahead. And thank you again, Dr. Akash. Thanks, Dana. Maybe next time we can do one about um, how you used uh, AI since we spoke in your practice and uh, 
we can we can see how that's changed your practice. I would love that. We'll make it a plan. All right. I'm going to th- have a great day, Dr. Akash. Are you ready for more? Swing by www.businessofesthetics.org. Resources for a free ebook and a vault of free resources. Elevate your aesthetic savvy. Explore now. Thank you for joining us this week on the Business of Aesthetic podcast series, brought to you by our gold sponsors, MRP and Equa Marketing, and silver sponsors, Lengea Law and Pro Knox. Would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the Business of Aesthetics podcast? Or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetic business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? Head over to www.businessofesthetics.org podcast show and apply to be featured as a guest on the show. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. If you would like to engage with today's speakers or any of our past speakers, join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Thank you and have a great day.